click on Hello everybody. Welcome to the third panel discussion of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. The topic of this panel is environmental justice in the North Country. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee peoples, specifically the Ganingaaga Mohawk. In addition, those of us who are part of this colonial society acknowledge our role as settlers on this territory, honoring those who have stewarded this land for time immemorial. We also want to acknowledge our own position as organizers of this summit. My name is Zivu Aguilar Itzo. And my name is Blake Lavia. I come and grew up from in Guanajuato, Mexico, Otomi, Chichimeca, Purepecha territory. I come to this land as a settler. While I also come to this land as a settler from the country that since 1861 has been known as the modern nation of Italy. To begin this conversation, we wanted to show you a map, a map that to many may seem unfamiliar. That is because we have been taught a specific type of geography in schools. We have been taught a, a settler colonial geography, a geography that was imposed on the land violently through genocide, through conquest. The riverways you see on this map have been exploited, have been dammed by a settler colonial society. The places, the place names that you see on this map have been in many cases attempt, attemptedly erased again by the settler colonial society. The settler colonial, colonial society placed its own borders, its own names on these maps. It divided communities, cut land apart through borders, through private property. Again, in talking about this story, the story of environmental justice in the North Country, Haudenosaunee territory, we must first undo these histories and begin to analyze and discuss the stories that lay underneath. So to situate you all, we want to reference the land and water that where we now stand. The water that flows by us is from the Nigenzage, the Grass River. It flows to its confluence with the uh, Ganyotalowanene, and again, pr forgive my pronunciation, the St. Lawrence River. The place, the connection between the grass and the St. Lawrence is one of the most polluted, or was one of the most polluted sites in on Turtle Island, what people call the United States of America or the American continent. This story, these stories of violence, of conquest, we will explore today in discussing this land and this territory. So without further ado, we would like, on behalf of the North Country Art, Land and Environment, we want to thank all our collaborating partners, the people, the organizations, and the land and the water who have made this summit possible. This program was founded by Humanities New York with the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The St. Lawrence Art Collaborative Grant and the Richard F. Grash Gallery. We would also like to thank North Country Public Radio for being our media sponsor and the Weed News for hosting us tonight. The special panel is happening in tandem with the Water and Origin, honoring the first storyteller exhibition and the Grass Talk virtual exhibition. And finally, we will pass you to our moderator, Agnes Williams. Greetings and Thanksgiving. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend the greetings and Thanksgiving to the Wings Collective, the panelists and our audience today uh, for this discussion on environmental justice in the North Country. My name is Agnes Williams. I'm a Seneca grandmother, mother, sister, and auntie from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation of Indians near Irving, New York in, uh, in the western part of the state. 
I'm your moderator for tonight's uh, discussion. And in the context of the doctrine of discovery, United States of America law rooted in the 15th century European papal bulls is the foundation of notions of white supremacy and Christian domination that not only enslaved black Africans, but destroyed native lives and North American environments. We are survivors of a 500 plus year American Holocaust of communicable diseases like smallpox and now again COVID-19. War with its subsequent rape of our mother, the earth and rape of missing and murdered, disappeared native women. Removal off of our original territories and sub subsequent loss of our food sources. Relocation onto reservations and into abusive boarding schools, then into industrially polluted cities. Our lands are, design are designated by the federal government of the United States with a policy called national sacrifice areas where extractive mining and technologies as well as industrial waste have rendered them uninhabitable, unsafe, and unhealthy. Today, once again, we witness the justice in America or the just us as the native legacy of the late Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg in her 2007 decision against the Oneida land claims versus the town of Cheryl here in New York. Ginsburg used the doctrine of discovery as a justification for her written decision regarding the Oneida's uh, and ignored the uh, United States treaty laws with the Oneida and the Haudenosaunee in the 1784 Canandaigua Treaty. The development of the first and the second world is dependent upon the underdevelopment of the third world for the workers and no development in the fourth world, indigenous peoples. Um, <clears throat> Where, the, where our natural resources are exploded and dumping of industrial waste have occurred. The Haudenosaunee continue, the Haudenosaunee continue to, su to suffer the consequences of the mid 20th century industrial attacks at Seneca, Tuscarora, Onondaga from nuclear development and waste disposal Added to that, in Mohawk North Country, General Motors and other industries have dumped heavy metals in the St. Lawrence River and native peoples stopped uh, in, in the St. Lawrence River. Native people stopped going extinct in 1900. We only have over uh, 100 years of physical recovery. And by the mid 1900s, the Haudenosaunee experienced industrial attacks on several of our communities. And this was not a coincidence. It all happened in, in mid-century. We are here to discuss the environmental injustices in the Mohawk North Country region and its impact on everyone. Today, we will hear presentations from four distinguished colleagues, Gaia D. Dukya, or Jackie Hill, Craig Arquat, both from Aquasasti Territory near Messina, New York, Stephanie Morning and Stephanie Morningside, Oneida from the Land Trust. You're invited to ask questions in the Zoom and YouTube chat rooms. Your questions will be compiled, after which 
I will direct each of our panelists to answer them. We will begin with Gaia D. Duck. Yeah, Jackie Hall. Please continue. Sego Skanagoga. Gaia Duck Yungats. Wagatahuni. My name is Jackie Hall. I'm Wolf Clan and I'm Mohawk from Akwesasne. I've been a reporter here for several years in Akwesasne, and I'm also an uh, activist. I chose to read a particular article that I wrote a few months back. I did a series of editorials called How a Pandemic Changed Akwesasne. And this particular article I wrote was a result of becoming aware that uh, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribal Council canceled the meeting that would have been formed Akwesaslono that the EPA made changes to um, their plan for the Grass River cleanup, last minute changes to judge more of the Grass River and expose us to more PCBs. So I decided to write this editorial. I'm gonna just share a visual of the area I'm talking about. So here, I'm particularly talking about the Grass River here in this area and how it affects Akwesasne. How a, how a Pandemic Changed Akwesasne by Jacqueline Hall. It seems as though the, the majority of Akwesasne are getting back to the land with the encouragement of multiple organizations who have been distributing free seeds, samplings, plants, and supplies to create raised bed gardens. While it has become commonplace to see raised bed gardens all throughout Akwesasne, it seems as though many have forgotten why raised beds became a necessity in Akwesasne and why it is an important part of our history. It was not so long ago when our Dudas could sustain themselves completely off the land here in Akwesasne. There was a time our Dudas could fish in the river, hunt on the land, and grow food without worrying about the impact these locally caught and grown foods could have on the people and the future generations. That time has long passed. With multiple environmental genocides having taken place in Akwesasne in the past 120 years, our people have had to continuously adapt and innovate to continue to live off the land. Throughout all of the change and impacts felt by our people, our resilience as Ungwahuma people and adherence to our original teachings have persevered. Heavy industry has existed near Akwesasne since the early years of the 20th century. The Aluminum Company of America, the area's first large-scale industrial plant, opened in Messina, eight miles west of Akwesasne during 1903. The opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959 caused large-scale industrialization and attendant pollution on, on or near the Akwesasne Reservation. Reynolds Meadows built an aluminum reduction plant less than a mile from Akwesasne the same year the seaway opened. By 1962, cattle on Cornwall Island, also known as Gowanoga, were dying of fluoride poisoning. The effects of pollution at Akwesasne are evidenced by a decline in the number of people earning a living as farmers and fishermen in the area. In 1930, Akwesasne was the site of 129 commercial farms. In 1990, the figure was 19. According to figures obtained by Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, the estimated number of fishermen declined from 104 to 11 during the same period. This says an excerpt from the Encyclopedia of the Haudenosaunee. Surely these st statistics have changed since this excerpt was written. With the efforts of projects and organizations such as SAG Tawado, Akwesasne Cultural Center, Three Sisters Sovereignty Project, Ungwe, Thompson Island, Women's Wisdom Circle, and individual knowledge keepers hosting workshops aimed at teaching Akwesasne self-sufficiency. Many have gone forward with learning and getting back to the land. With all of the newfound knowledge comes a newfound responsibility to take it a step farther than being a caretaker of the land, but to be a land defender. Caretaking takes on a whole different realm than defending land, but both are equally important during these times, especially when we find ourselves coming back to the land to sustain ourselves and our families. With the travel restriction, restrictions put in place during this pandemic, many feel as if they have no choice but to hunt, gather, and garden within a 50-mile radius. But is it really the best thing for our people? We have to outweigh the pros and cons of remaining within an area 24 seven that is ultimately making our people sick. Although it does not come in the form of a cold or coronavirus for that matter, the deep rooted disease that has been continuously passed on unknowingly to our future generations has repercussions that are long lasting. Many people believe they drink because they drink bottled water, purchase food grown elsewhere and garden and raised beds that they are not as affected by this deep rooted disease given to us from industry. Sorry to remind people, but the water we use, the air we breathe, and the land we live on make up who we are. We are only as healthy as the land we call home, and our future generation's health depends on us. Heavy metals such as PCBs only leave our bodies through breast milk or semen. 
So the only way we can rid ourselves of this poison is by passing it on to our children. Many Akuza Sona are aware of the Grass River cleanup taking place as we speak. The dredging of the Grass River is stirring up sediments of the past and unleashing the same poisons that made living beings sick in the past. Although representatives of these industries assure us they are going about it as safely as possible, there is a low risk of exposure to Akuza Sona. There is still a risk that government and industry deem low, but the involvement and consultation of Akuza Sona on this possible risk was at a minimum. For example, one of EPA's most recent announcements regarding the Grass River cleanup made on April 15, 2020, states the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has modified a plan to address sediment contaminated with PCBs at the Grass River Superfund site with, uh, in Messina, New York. The EPA continues to listen closely and respond to the needs of this community as a priority. And we are working hard with our state and tribal partners to advance the cleanup of this critically important river system, said EPA Regional Administrator Pete Lopez. The modification to the plan will provide for the removal of more sediment and will ensure that the new tugboat can operate efficiently and effectively, all while remaining on track with the project. A change in plans for the Grass River cleanup includes dredging and removing an extra 90,000 cubic tons, only 0.3 miles away from the St. Lawrence River, and scarily close to the water treatment plant on Gowanoge. When the EPA makes these plans, it does not include the Canadian side of the border or how it could affect the north side of the river. There was no prior consultation or information shared because of this ongoing pandemic. The previous Grass River information session in Akwazasne was canceled. This extra dredging and removal to accommodate a bigger tugboat could have very well went unnoticed due to this pandemic. These plans to dig up and change our rivers for the convenience of a project is only a miniature version of what took place during the construction of the seaway. There was clearly impacts on our people when the seaway was built, so one can only guess what the impacts will be from this invasive project. Going into this year's gardening and gathering season, we must be aware of the different risk and impacts that it may have on our people, the closer we are to these industrial sites. While well-meaning knowledge keepers suggest locations to gather and hunt that are within the suggested 50 mile, right, 50 mile radius, it is our responsibility to remind the people of our land's living history and continue to pass on this knowledge so long as our lands and waters are sick. Stay vigilant and research information for yourself during this pandemic, especially when it comes to our land and water. To have a healthy relationship with our Mother Earth, we must reconcile with her and help her to heal. How can we do that while at the same time depending on her for nourishment? Um, that's the end of the editorial that I wrote. No, that was very good. Thank you. Our next presenter uh, will be Craig Arquette, uh, who is an Aquasas ni Mohawk. Uh, my name is Craig Arquette, uh, Mohawk from Akwazasne, and um, I'm going to be starting my presentation here. First, I just want to just pull up a, a general map of Akwazasne, uh, of where we're located. We're in uh, um, upstate New York. Our territory is, um, uh, is in upstate New York and, and extends into the Canadian provinces of uh, Quebec and Ontario. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the industries and, uh, and the contamination that they've caused uh, in and around uh, Akwazasne. In uh, Akwazasne, we have a number of health issues. And these include uh, diabetes and various cancers. There are several other uh, health issues are a long list, but these are the two main ones that get talked about uh, the most. And um, over the last couple of years, our community has faced a lot of cancers. And that's because uh, we've been exposed to the contaminants for uh, about 60 years now. And that really is a lifetime of exposures to to contaminants. And, and that's why we're we're seeing a lot more cancers now. And in this map, I just wanted to show how close the, the industries are. And this is just showing the, the western side of Akwazasne. And around the edge, we have the General Motors Superfund site. And then on the opposite side of um, the General Motors site is the Reynolds Meadows plant, which is now in a, in a, in a co op plant. But from there, about seven miles upstream in the town of Messina is the coal plant and 
and that was uh, started operation in 1903, and the, and both the Reynolds and the GM plant they were in operation in uh, uh, 1960. And to the north, in the city of Cornwall, there were about seven factories there, but they're they're not a, they don't exist now. And these facilities, these industries, they've um, released a lot of contaminants uh, in and around Akazasane. And uh, these have been uh, PCBs, P PAHs, phenols, fluoride, and mercury. Mercury, mercury uh, contamination mainly came from the Canadian um, factories uh, near Cornwall and fluoride that, that mainly was in the form of uh, air uh, contamination from the Reynolds plant and PCBs, PAHs and phenols. That's mainly from the Alcoa and, and uh, uh, GM plant. And so our community has been, has these industries around us. So we have to think about, all right, why, why are they even here in the first place? And in this, this map, I guess I love showing maps. Uh, this one, I just want to show how, how how close everything is to us. And in the bottom left, bottom right corner is, is Akwazasne. And um, you see the uh, Cornwall Island, that's in our territory. But below that, you see two um, facilities of, uh, you have the GM plant and Reynolds. But also on the map, you see labeled the, the Robert Moses power dam. And, and, and that's what um, the power dam, St. Lawrence Seaway construction was finished about 1958. And then immediately after, both the Reynolds and GM plant started construction and they were both in operation by 1960. And you can see that the Reynolds and GM plant, they weren't near um, Messina. They were located right, right up against uh, Aquazosinin. And at the GM plant, uh, as soon as they were in operation, they started placing their, dumping their waste onto their property and they didn't select it in, in an isolated area. They, they put it right furthest away from their facility, right on our, our doorstep. In this picture, I'm standing on top of the GM dump and I'm looking towards Akwazasane. At the bottom of the dump, that that water feature you see there, that's a cove that connects to the St. Lawrence River. And in those, um, in, and on the left-hand side of the picture, you see some buildings with the red roof. Those are apartments and you can see how close they are to um, the, this is, those apartments are on tribal lands. So you can see how close this GM dump is to Akwazasne. And um, I should, probably note that when a GM dump was first being created in the 1960s, those structures probably weren't there, but on the, on the high ground uh, in the picture in the trees, you see some buildings there. Those are houses and there are there always, those houses were always there. There were always people living in that area. So you can still see how close everything is. And um, this cove was, uh, it was contaminated from the GM site it has been uh, cleaned up now and uh, upstream of this cove there's a uh, uh, beaver pond and wetlands and uh, that's also contaminated that was contaminated from spills and contaminants migrating onto tribal property the wetlands and the beaver pond are on tribal lands And um, I guess that was sort of was um, kind of two things that were really bothered um, our community was was um, first at the Robert Moses power plant power dam brought in these industries with the cheap power, but 
Akwazasa had, we never benefited from that. And even to this day, we, we, we still haven't. The town of Messina, they, they benefit from it, the industries. And, um, and, and the fact that they were uh, set up right on our doorstep, um, exposing us to the contamination. And I guess the third issue or event that that our community uh, disliked was the GM bank bankruptcy. 2009, General Motors Corporation filed for bankruptcy and they came out of bankruptcy by 2011. And out of that bankruptcy, the, the Racer Trust was formed to uh, manage uh, the properties that GM abandoned. Uh, GM got rid of all the properties that were contaminated or, or costing them money. That was about 28 properties and um, so they're out of the picture they they got away with it you know and it's not only is it not fair but it's that's just not right and uh, they got away with it the General Motors um, race your trust their mandate is to clean up the finish the cleanup of the properties and and to sell them. Uh, their racer trust is working with under a, a fixed budget. If if we still had General Motors in the picture, it, we would have had at least a chance to keep pressuring them to do more with uh, with the cleanups. But that's not the case now. It's just it's just difficult to to get more work done. So I guess we've been kind of beaten up uh, over the years, but we also had some successes too. And and these successes go back to the beginning. In, in uh, 1985, um, a Mohawk midwife gets New York State DEC involved. In those early years, uh, the agencies were involved, uh, the state and EPA, but they were mostly focused on the industries, that the footprint of, of the facilities themselves. They, they really weren't looking at the, the needs of the community. So um, this, this one individual goes to Albany, goes to the DEC's wildlife pathologist, explains to him that She's seen a lot of health issues in Akwazasana and, and she gets him to come to Akwazasana and to take a look for her, himself and to collect samples. And in his mind, the pathologist wanted to just, um, he just figured, oh, this is another person that's making, um, um, exaggerating what's going on. I'll, I'll go take a look, collect samples and be done with it. Close the book. But he saw it for himself. Uh, uh, visible contamination in Aquazosne on our lands and he collected samples and that verified uh, what he was seeing. And that that's, was just kind of the start of getting a dog acknowledgement that the community was was impacted. That, that did take some convincing in, in work. And then um, another success was in um, 1990 when um, a small success was uh, when the record of decision for the GM site was was issued. Um, record of decision is just a document uh, describing how the properties were going to be uh, cleaned up, and and um, the tribe had had set up our own uh, cleanup levels of what we think are are protective, and there were. Um, for for our uh, lands, like I said, uh, contamination had, had had spilled over into reservation lands. So we'd set standards on how those lands would be cleaned up, and and uh, in this record of decision, they adopted our our standard of cleanup for tribal property. And um, for example, on the GM property, the cleanup of soils was 10 parts per million. Uh, uh, cleanup of soils on reservation was one part per million. And in um, 
1995, um, General Motors proposed to make some changes to the record of decision. Uh, there were two record of decisions for the General Motors site, uh, and they were just one dealt with one part of property and another one uh, dealt with a, a second part of property. And they both had different cleanup levels for each of their sections. For example, uh, one part of property was cleaned up, was to be cleaned up to 500 parts per million and other part was to 10 parts per million. General Motors wanted to make them equal, bring them both, both decisions to the same cleanup level of 500 parts per million. Uh, EPA issued a release of the proposed changes and our community you know, responded in a big way. You know, we we um, held meetings, we had protests, and then we had massive letter writing campaign campaigns uh, uh, to EPA. And result of, of that effort, you know, the EPA dropped the proposed changes and, and left it the same of keeping that, that one section to 10 part in part per million. So I guess the point I'm, I'm making here is you know, one individual you know, took it upon herself to, to do something and she spoke to the right person who was um, motivated to, to do something uh, on, on our behalf. And, and then um, and the other is that our, when our community can come together, we can do some really really great things. And that's kind of but, but what I have to talk about. So I'll be ending. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is uh, Stephanie Morningstar, Morningstar, and she's with the Land Trust. Hey, go everybody. My name is Stephanie Morningstar, I'm Oneida Turtle Clan. Um, I'm the executive director of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. And I'm here today to talk about the ways that we're addressing environmental contamination in our communities, including um, the communities of our indigenous partners and relatives. Um, before we start, I just wanted to briefly frame um, the reason that I chose to do the work that I do. Um, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. My mother um, was uh, Oneida, and um, my family is from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Um, my mother was a residential, a legacy residential school survivor, and um, carried with her a deep level of intergenerational trauma that um, really um, affected her health. And it started making me think after her death in 2010 about the ways that um, she may have survived if she had not experienced um, the health issues that she experienced. Um, part of the way that I, I guess, um, dealt with that was by um, joining a team of healthcare professionals and starting a clinic on Six Nations called Judah's Place um, in partnership with a, a faith keeper and a medicine helper, as well as a, a Mohawk doctor. And um, that was sort of the beginning or the initiation for me into seeing the direct effects of environmental contamination on our people. Um, I wanted to be able to figure out a way to help solve this. And what I found was that um, it was the extractive nature of the way that the land and, um, and our waters have been treated and the, the carelessness for which those, um, those relatives have been treated over the years and having that direct correlation of climate change and environmental contamination correlating along with um, colonized ways of being, doing, and knowing. 10 years, 11 years later, here I am with you, the executive director of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. I had a long journey along the way. Um, I'm an herbalist. I work with BIPOC populations specifically. So I work with people of color mainly and um, uplift and in, um, celebrate indigenous ways of knowing and de decolonial frames for herbal medicine. So it's all about working with the land and, and really honoring and respecting the land. Um, 
So moving on, this is a picture of our um, our network during a network gathering last year, and you can see we're all sorts of people of color from all over the globe, um, really focusing specifically on global indigenous ways of being, doing, and knowing. Our goal is to create land sovereignty and advance land sovereignty through the development of a community land trust and a conservation land trust. So basically a hybrid between two types of land trust that really recognizes um, that our global indigenous ways of being, doing, and knowing specifically with regenerative agriculture and the ways that we approach environmental stewardship should be central to the tenets of how we develop the, um, our relationships with land with one another and specifically around centering the sovereignty of indigenous nations across the, the Northeast and across Turtle Island. So our vision is to advance land sovereignty in the Northeast region through permanent and secure land tenure for indigenous, black, Latinx, and Asian farmers and land stewards who will work with the land in the sacred manner that honors our ancestors' dreams for sustainable farming, human habitat, ceremony, native ecosystem restoration, and cultural preservation. What makes us unique is our hybrid land trust model. Um, so we're working with a community land trust model that addresses all of the sort of basic farming needs and feeding our communities and living situations and blending that with this conservation land trust model that is specific to some of the issues we're speaking to today regarding conservation and restoration of our waterways, our native species ecosystems, um, specifically also culturally significant lands, burial grounds, um, um, places to do rites of passage, as well as just making land healthy again for hunting, harvesting, um, growing food in the ground, ceremony, and again, reburial. And really what that's supposed to equal these two hybrid approaches is to um, equate to or manifest health, wealth, and joy in our communities. So creating or um, reinstituting healthy, permanently accessible land, um, connecting folks with um, the being able to grow food and medicine in the ground again. It's really hard to hear folks having to um, do uh, a braised, braised bed gardening and knowing that that um, may be a cultural thing, but it's also for a reason. So being able to grow and grow soil and build soil again, um, the joyful honoring of our cultural life ways on our homelands, um, to address native species ecosystem restoration and to regard um, invasive species as um, settler species that um, can also work with us to bring health and wealth to our communities, as well as building a new economic system that reclaims, builds, and shares wealth. Um, and a big approach for us is to is regenerative agriculture, specifically in um, the soil or the carbon sequestration that we're aiming to achieve through regenerative agriculture. And ultimately, what we are approaching is to look at creation, so something that we are a part of, creation or nature, um, as something that is also a living being. So a huge part of our work, as I'll talk about in a moment, is regarding the rights of nature and personhood. This is a model of our land trust um, and our programs for the inaugural phase of our emergence from the soil that we've been building over the last two years together. Um, we focused on governance development. We focused on um, recognizing our place and our situation as stewards of the land. And um, we've, we've found that there's three approaches that we need to take that are all overlapping that will result in manifesting the vision of the land trust. And that would be to connect folks to land and also to defend the land as well as cultivating the resources in order to be able to get those folks on land. Um, one of the key tenets of the work that we're doing is um, in our approach is that we're not just consulting with indigenous people. I mean, I'm indigenous myself and uh, this is an indigenous led um, initiative, but um, recognizing the multitudes of nations across the Northeast part of Turtle Island who are, whose lands have been stolen from them. So really understanding um, treaties and understanding unceded territory and what that actually means. So, um, you know, looking at the timeline of colonization and the timeline of contact um, and what the environment looked like before and what the environment looks like now, we can see that we are in a deep crisis that has taken 200 years to make happen, basically. So we're looking at not being able to reverse that crisis, but we need to build our 
we need to build resilience in our communities to address that crisis and now deal with it because we're living in it. Um, so that's what the land trust is all about. It's about getting folks onto land who need to grow food and medicines for their communities in order to survive. Um, we don't want to be re um, reliant on bottled water. We don't want to be reliant on food that we need to purchase from a grocery store. Uh, we don't want to be involved in the capitalist extractive system that has been, um, that has basically um, created the system and the issue that we're all dealing with right now. So um, the approaches that make us unique from other land trusts are that we're really looking at the root causes of issues. Um, the fact that indigenous hands have not been stewarding the land and that there have been no trespassing signs placed on land that is our homelands and our unceded territories is a shame. And one of the ways that we're trying to approach that is through looking at the systems that created that. Um, we are 100% BIPOC led and driven. I am um, the executive director. We have two other co-directors joining us and we have um, members, indigenous community members and black folks on our board of directors. Um, Again, we're um, mainly looking at um, not just consultation with indigenous communities, but specifically partnerships with indigenous communities. And we're just beginning this process now. We've been kind of internal and are now just starting to make, make relationships with indigenous communities, but in a more formal way. But I will say that one of the deepest uh, messages that we're trying to share is, and something that I've been involved with along the way is around um, conservation and including indigenous um, knowledge and traditional ecological, ecological knowledge in, um, in land conservation. So really resituating indigenous hands on the land and, and taking those no trespassing signs down in our homelands. Um, we're a hybrid land trust, as I mentioned, so we're using a unique approach that is getting folks on the land to be able to farm, but also um, really recognizing that farming in and of itself, it can be an extractive method and that we need to really be looking at regenerative solutions. Um, we're also looking at land-based wealth redistribution, including um, something called rematriation of land. And um, again, we're working specifically to advance carbon drawdown um, by mandating regenerative agriculture methods in our ground leases. And our, our approach is a decentralized approach to leadership, meaning that we don't have a top-down structure. We have more of a cyclical structure that um, has taken a bit of inspiration from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Council's um, consensus building process. So as I mentioned, we are working on building indigenous relationships and partnerships and are starting to hear feedback about what um, communities want and what they need. One of those things is rematriation of land. I have here a quote um, from Michelle Shenandoah's project that was um, had some land rematriated um, to their project. Lizelle Haynes is the person who uh, rematriated the land and she says, I have lived on Oneida lands for 43 years and inherited this land from my mother. When I heard Michelle talk about the Oneida women gathering on their homelands and their desire to have a place of their own, I knew this was the right thing to do. So considering that and just speaking out to an audience full of folks, I don't know who you are, but um, if that's something, if you have inherited generational wealth, inherited land and are looking to build relationships, you might want to consider um, rematriating that land back to the nations on whose territories you occupy. In addition, um, we're advocating for other land trusts, farmer services organizations, conservation organizations to consult and partner with indigenous nations when it comes to stewarding their own homelands. Additionally, we're starting to promote and build a process for something called a voluntary land tax. And that is for people who are occupying our homelands to recognize that and to pay a tax in order to build wealth in those communities. Another method that we're using in order to resituate indigenous land stewardship is something called a cultural respect easement. This is a permanent easement that is placed on the title or deed of your land. And what it's doing basically is it's opening up access to that land to um, the original peoples who have stewarded that, those lands since time immemorial. Um, the way that the easement works is that it's a, a legal agreement that is um, basically negotiated over a period of relationship building um, conversations and meetings um, that ultimately works out how the land will be engaged and any of the boundaries that the property owner has or that you have um, or that um, the First Nation might have. So some of the ways that you can work with a cultural respect easement is to open up access for hunting, for harvesting, for ceremony, for reburial, 
um, for agriculture and uh, for rites of passage. Um, you can leave it even as simple as just open access. So um, it's a really wonderful way to start building relationships with um, folks and, and really getting to know the indigenous community that you um, whose territory you occupy. Um, one of the final ways that we're engaging um, engaging indigenous stewardship is through something called personhood or the rights of nature. Dr. Robin Mall Kimmerer said in her books, Braiding Sweetgrass, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital or natural resources. But to our people, it was everything. Identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. And I would challenge to say that it still is the source of all that sustains us. Um, so personhood is a way of recognizing something like the St. Lawrence River that is um, obviously sacred to our people and to um, Haudenosaunee, um, as well as a relative and a living being. Um, it's actually a way to recognize that policy-wise so you can actually protect that land through things like lawsuits. Um, it's something that's a fairly new concept, but um, what you can see here behind this image or the image behind these words is a, a picture of wild rice and wild rice has actually gained personhood status um, through the Anishinaabe, the work of the Anishinaabe people. Um, they've actually protected wild rice through this personhood. Um, there have been rivers and mountains that have been gained, um, granted personhood and part of the work that we're doing as a land trust is to recognize personhood with on the land holdings that we hold in our trust as well as to advocate for personhood and, and facilitate that process for um, anybody who wants to uh, engage us for that so it's a it's a fairly new concept but we're really excited to talk about it and to um, dig into that work with the earth law center the next steps we have are to continue our consultation and to continue building bridges and building relationships with the um, various leadership across the Northeast and the various indigenous nations across the Northeast. Um, we're working on language justice, we're evolving a reparations map, we're trying to really just get the, um, the second phase of the land trust up and running. Um, ways that you can support us are just getting in touch. We have a webinar series that we're hosting, um, you know, be in touch and like we're specifically interested in collaborating and partnering with indigenous communities to advance some of these concepts that we've been talking about up until now. And uh, take a look, let us know um, if you have a question, you know, feel free to um, get in touch with us. My email address is connect at mefolklandtrust.org. And uh, in closing, I just wanted to share one of our inspirations, Fanny Lou Hamer, and something that she said, and she said it more simply than anybody I could, um, anything that I could say, and that's nobody's free until everybody's free. And until everybody's free, I'm gonna continue working. So now go ahead, thanks for having me. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Stephanie. Very good. Okay, we have one question that came for you. Uh, how has the doctrine of discovery affected land ownership and the privatization of land? For me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how has the doctrine of discovery affected land ownership and the privatization of land? The doctrine of discovery is one of the seeds that was planted that has created this land trust, basically. So looking at... Um, the idea and the concept of terra nullius is something that um, has deeply informed our work, especially regarding um, who the rightful stewards are of the land and who can quote unquote own land. Um, really the doctrine of discovery is the, um, the catalyst for everything that's happened up until right now and to see the St. Lawrence, to see Onondaga Lake, to see all of the super fun sites that have been created based on the results of the spirit of the doctrine of discovery fuels me every single day. So the work is um, to dismantle the doctrine of discovery, absolutely. Um, and to get as many um, organizations and um, folks who have benefited from that to officially renounce the doctrine of discovery and to continue to challenge that. Um, it is because of the spirit of that culture and um, that fed white supremacy culture and has fed the extractive and violent mechanisms that have created 
these health disparities amongst our people, as well as the um, extraction and silencing and erasure of our ways of being, doing, and knowing. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, land ownership and privatization, I think, really speaks back to the English property laws. And um, when you talk about the doctrine of discovery and the land trust, um, who actually does own the land that you have in the land trust? Nobody owns the land, actually. And that's one of the things that I'll, I'll share. Um, we don't believe that land can be owned or water or any other natural relative. Um, what we can do is hold a legal title that's legal under colonial law. So I wanna be very clear that there are two, um, two separate questions here. One is about ownership. Um, I can't imagine owning a piece of land even with a title um, written to me in, or a deed. Um, I would imagine that owning land would be like owning a human being, um, which would mean that you were enslaving them. So to me, land ownership is, um, it's a colonial Western concept that doesn't have any um, any place in in the work that we're doing. Um, and one of the ways that we're trying to shift this conversation is about addressing that directly, um, that land ownership is a colonial concept. So uh, when it comes to private land ownership, um, what we're doing is we are holding title and we're creating um, a governing body for each one of those deeds to oversee. So it's called a 501c3, 501c2, two-tiered community land trust that holds mm -hmm. title and actually creates a board for each title holding that is uh, made up of the community, the people living on the land, and um, part of our board. So the um, it's it's quite a an interesting mechanism um, to be able to create land access, but also hold accountability within that for values. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple other questions that came in. Um, one for uh, Jackie. Uh, how has Jackie? Are you still there? Yes. Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. How has COVID-19 affected the Aquasasini community? In so many ways, but I'll stick to the discussions that we're having and with the editorial that I wrote. There, it's almost all encompassing when we talk about the doctrine of discovery. So I'll stay focused on our environment. What's what really weighed on my mind when I found out that the EPA changed the, the plans last minute. I know uh, Craig Arquette would know, like they informed the community like over a year ago and then nothing happened. And because of this pandemic, they just completely canceled it and they didn't tell anyone and they put pamphlets in a mailbox. And we know with the pandemic, how slow our postage was. So people got these letters after the fact. And when they're looking at it, it was like, I went down to the west end of Gawanoge and I looked and I seen them already judging the river. Like I could stand on the west end, just away from the parking lot of our water treatment plant and I could watch them judging the Grass River. And because we're on a border, the Mohawk Council of Akwazasne and the Canadian side of Akwazasne, which is just across the river, they, they said they were upset because there was no consultation. And it's like you even look at the maps when the, what they give out in the mail, it literally shows like the contamination and it stops right at the border and they're drawn. Like somehow that PCB just stops right at the border of this imaginary line and doesn't affect the Canadian side of Akwazasne. And it's the lack of consultation and communication on the EPA's part and on the tribal council's part because they're autumn, like ultimately the answer to the BIA, the answer to the US government, they're the hand, they're the extended hand of the US government and they're taking part and they're helping them push this agenda like it it's um upsetting and the fact that we only have one local newspaper that shares media and so it's the lack of coverage and accountability on on the epa's part the grass river remediations part the st Andrews tribal council's part and i don't even know where i was going with this to be honest <laughs> no, you answered. Yeah, you answered the discovery. question. Yeah, <laughs> they they also asked about how the uh, community was uh, vulnerable to pandemics like COVID nineteen. Are are a lot of people uh, experiencing illness? Surprisingly, we haven't been hit as hard as like the Navajos who are. I heard they're taking the vaccine already because they've been hit so hard, 
And a lot of our young people and young parents won't even send their children back to school due to the fears of another outbreak. And are, we're highly against vaccinations, a lot of the parents. So the fact that they want all online, like even if you're all online, they want the students to have the vaccination. And it's things like that where our young parents are saying like, no, that, that's enough. We're not gonna let our kids be guinea pigs like during the residential school and day school era. So we've taken it upon ourselves to homeschool our children. We're actually uh, currently occupying land out in Dundee to get as far away from these industrial plants as we can. And that was like, that's because of the pandemic. Like it was like now or never, like we need to change something right now because we're not gonna send our kids back into these schools and allow this education system that was basically formed from the doctrine of discovery and residential schools and to take the children from their parents and where they're we're supposed to be teaching our children. And right now we're starting to take that back. So I feel like the pandemic's been positive for us in a way, but it's trying to be, make people more aware that there is a different way and we don't have to subject their kids to a COVID vaccine to send them to school so we can do a nine to five job. Like that's, that's all, like people have to understand the doctrine of discovery that all comes from that, like that whole mindset. I think I answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you did. You did. Okay. <laughs> so um, thank you. Craig, um, how does the St. Regis Mohawk tribe monitor the Superfund sites? How does the St. Regis Mohawk tribe monitor the Superfund sites? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I, I work for the tribe's environment division and um, it, uh, my job I'm the um, environmental specialist, and what I do is um, whenever they're doing any work on the Superfund site, the General Motors site specifically, I'm there to make sure that the work that they're doing isn't impacting the community. And uh, that also involves um, um, when the industry is uh, ready, uh, is planning on doing some work, you know, they write up a plan of uh, a work plan of what they're doing. Uh, our office reviews it. And, you know, we have um, um, consultants to, to help us with some of the, with the technical issues. And we uh, uh, comment uh, and, and uh, to EPA and with DEC. And we uh, attend meetings uh, with the industries to uh, um, to express our issues with, with what their, uh, each individual plan that's, that's going to happen. The, uh, when you say the EPA, now that's the, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the federal government, right? Yes. And the DEC is, uh, the Department of Environmental, Environmental Con Conservation. Conservation? Yes. And that's New York State, right? Yeah. Okay, so you have to work with with the two different, uh, the state government and the federal government with the monitoring. Yes. Okay, and then the other part of the question was, um, how uh, how can uh, the cleanup of the rivers be done? Is there any way possible to try two, to clean the rivers? There's just two way two is a two approach to cleaning up a river that has contaminated sediments and that is to um do nothing and and um let uh, put some um material over the sediments sand and gravel and and um large rocks a, a series of layer layers to uh to to isolate it, to keep it from um, to from the wildlife, uh, to the fish and benthic organisms, and the other approach is to excavate it, and and that means just using uh, equipment, uh, um, construction equipment to um, excavators or and. Uh, just pull the sediments out of the river bottom, and um, but that has to be done in a in a way that you you're trying to uh, keep the suspended so sediments 
in that area and not uh, flowing uh, down river. And, and the idea of um, uh, dredging is to you know reduce, get rid of that material so it won't be uh, impacting, continually releasing its contaminants. It'll be there if, if, if the sediments are, are left alone and the decision is to do nothing, then they're there. They may even get a covering of material, but it, it doesn't mean it ends. It, it means it just how just prolongs it. It just covering you really just covering up the issue. It's going to resurface down the road with some event. Rivers are dynamic. And um, so if you we just put a cover over it and do nothing that kind of isolates it for now for that um, first time period. But then you're just sending that problem uh, down the road for future generations uh, to they'll get hit with it in large dose if, if there's river bottom is disturbed some way. And so the idea with dredging is to get that bulk material out. It's messy work and it does stir up uh, contaminants in the immediate area. But down the road, that's just, it's less material that could resurface and contaminate and recontaminate the system for future generations. So those are these are just broad views of um, of river cleanup. It's there's a lot of perspectives uh, for for each each approach. So, so I, and I'm willing to to discuss this uh, more uh, offline to, to anyone. Uh, and um, so yes, please uh, reach out to me. I, I love to share uh, ideas and, and what, what your perspective is and where you're coming from. I like to understand that more, so. so Thank now. you. Thank you. Um, I know on our reservation at Cataraugus, we're downstream from this uh, West Valley nuclear waste site and the Cataraugus Creek, which runs through our reservation, uh, you know, is carrying all kinds of uh, radiation. Uh, there was a super fun site also in Gowanda on the river, the Peter Cooper uh, site, which was a tannery and uh, a lot of uh, sediment had gone into there and uh, we were dredging for a while um, the water though that comes down the cataracts creek goes into lake erie then it goes into the water intake for erie county so um, the scientists have looked at the radiation contamination and found uh, several uh, on the other side of the falls uh, radiation has has radiation been been found in in any one any of the waters at Aquasasni? No, it hasn't. I and I'm glad. Uh, we got we we if anything we looked out on that, and I'm sorry that you have that. I don't know. I don't have uh, any idea it's how to um, even try and address that in in set, contaminated um, sediments nuclear contaminated sediments. That's, uh, that's a difficult issue. Because in the, in the, um, around in the fifties or sixties, the, they put the two, uh, nuclear plants in Oswego, New York. And there's a lot of, uh, radiation coming off of those plants as well. And, uh, when they gave us the report about the radiation, uh, the people around the whole Great Lakes is really looking at yeah, we have a, a nuke in St. Dusky, and then there's the two nukes in Oswego. So there's a lot of concern, and you guys are downstream. But somebody <laughs> did say there was there was uh, contamination in the St. Lawrence River. So that's why I was wondering if that had been detected um, on the Aquasusney Reservation. It, it would be news to me. 
You need a Geiger counter. <laughs> we have one in our office. <laughs> the and, and you know the whole thing about the water and the contamination and then you know trying to find uh, fresh fresh drinking water for people uh, that are on affected lands, uh, contaminated lands is a really big issue in uh, Indian country as well. Um, so uh, Jackie, do you, do you know of any uh, of the uh, other problems with the land or the water in terms of uh, radiation? I can talk about a future issue that I come across. I'm not sure about the American side, but the Canadian side. Right. So we have this seaway claim coming up and it it was supposed to come shortly after the Dundee referendum happened, but it was stalled because a lot of us appealed the Dundee um, land surrender. So with the seaway, we have, I was able to get one of the band council district chiefs to confirm that the seaway had wanted to expand. They wanted to dig into our river and expand the seaway and raise our bridge. And we have become informed about what super tankers are they're these bigger ships and we're we were trying to wrap our minds about like why do they need bigger ships coming through our waters because we already know the Mi'kmaq they've already raised their bridge and then Kahnawake is already talking about being relocated and we're the third lock in so I've come across information because they're canceling pipelines a lot like in Standing Rock and everyone's celebrating but if you really look into it it's a failing economy and what Canada is doing is they're looking into rare earth elements and they have 40% of the world's uh, rare earth elements. So it's um, unregulated and it's new and they're starting to um, explore places. And of course it's their reservations like in Asadaga, there's a new a mine that they're re-exploring out there for these rare earth elements. And then I found out it exposes us to naturally occurring radiation. So when they do find these elements, which they're trying to get like uranium and like those type of things, how are they gonna right. transport you know what I mean? Like they're gonna probably put them in these ships and they're gonna be traveling through our waters. And so one one ship gets stuck or like, I don't know what spills in our water and then we have to deal with that. And that's something that's gonna be coming up very soon because they're actively exploring Turtle Island right now for these elements and to get their hands on more uranium. Mm -hmm. but that's in Canada. I'm not sure if it's in the United States, if you can find more information on that. Yep. We've got a lot of, uh, well, nationally, the uh, um, Nuclear Information Resource Center in Washington, D.C., uh, with Diane Dorigo has been working with us on the West Valley. When we're trying to get full cleanup um, of that, uh, usually, you know, with the waste, they uh, solidify it. But with this, uh, and then just trying to get a national and international uh, get them to, to stop producing more waste. And, uh, you know, that really is a big issue uh, because they're really looking at, as the uh, fossil fuel industry is declining, they're really looking at nuclear to replace, which is even more dangerous and more of an immediate threat to our communities. So we need people to do that. We have a couple more, uh, a, a general question for any one of you. Is, um, can college students create a fundraiser or help with to help with the donations? Is there a way to do that? Any, I guess it depends any, on what donations you're talking about. Um, well, for your for the land trust, or you know, if, if college students wanted to do a fundraiser at their at their uh, institution, um, do does your organization accept donations? Our organization absolutely accepts donations and we also raise money for initiatives like this. So um, we're doing something called, uh, we actually just finished our first webinar series where um, we brought on different subject ex experts that have been helping us work out the land trust details. And each one of those webinars is a way to generate money in order to be able to feed those initiatives. So not our specific initiatives, but um, you know, having a webinar about something like this, I think would be really valuable. And then all funds would be directed toward um, if there's a nonprofit or if there's a way to um, channel the funding into the community to specific programming to 
help with this, that's absolutely something that the Oak Land Trust is happy to do. Um, we receive donations as well, um, but I would want to defer that to um, just being a pass-through organization to help support this initiative. Ooh. Okay, how about at Akwesasne? Is there any uh, donations needed there? For sure. Um, we're in our fourth week of the land occupation out in what they call Dundee, or Jigali Stizale. It's um, what I talked about, that land claim referendum where Canada kind of had an underhanded deal and tried to make us surrender our title, even though they're giving us money because we never surrendered our land. So we're out there right now and we're doing a land back language camp with the young people that aren't going back to school. So we're trying to, like myself, I'm trying to learn the language alongside my children. So we're out there on the land and it's good hunting ground where we are. Like right now, the young men we're bringing out there to do hunting. So we have community Aquazaslono here that are doing online auctions. We have like a raffle going on because they seized the vehicle at the border, like to raise the money back because it cost a thousand dollars to get our vehicle back. And um, little things like that, uh, I, I welcome anybody to do a fundraiser and we have a email account like the Ganyakahaga land back at gmail.com is where a lot of people have been sending their donations. We have uh, t-shirts, like we have all kinds of different things you can find on our Facebook site for the land back language camp. And oh, what's the name of the Facebook site? Ganyakahaga land back language camp. Okay, so you need to spell it. K A N I E N K E H A K A. Okay. I think I did that right. <laughs> <laughs> then it's just okay. land back language camp. Land back, land back language camp. That's a great idea. Yeah. Someone can write okay. it in the chat so people can take it yeah. off from there. Okay. Yeah. Put it in the chat. And then, um, Greg, how about donations? Is there is the tribe in need of any uh, fundraisers or donations? Jackie's call uh, sounds pretty good. I had to direct people to that one. Okay, okay, that's good. And um, I think I, we have one more uh, general question. Um, let's see here. It was here, but I don't see it anymore. Okay, here it is. Can someone give us a brief description of the doctrine of discovery and its history? Who wants to go first? I think that's you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll try. I'll start a little bit. Um, the doctrine of discovery is actually U.S. law. And um, I had written down a date when it when it kind of came into being and it it's kind of been developing uh it started in this notion from uh from from the papal bulls of the 15th century and in the papal bulls they had papal bulls for africa and papal bulls for north america and it, it basically says that uh, if you're not christian uh, you can be killed and your land can be and your property can be seized uh, by the European uh, ex uh, explorers. And, you know, basically this is what was done when Christopher Columbus came and, and, and sat down. And it's, it's been ingrained, uh, this notion uh, that uh, the European uh, kingdoms were superior to, uh, and the people of Europe were superior to people in Africa and people to, which, you know, really is the foundation of slavery and and is, is part of the foundation of, of the invisibility. I think that's what we've been hearing today, you know, the invis invisibility of the Native North America, because uh, there's been many things told to us, you know, that the land was vacant, uh, terra nullis, you know, that idea, there's nothing here. Uh, you know, when when there were millions, millions of people that were here uh, prior to uh, contact. And uh, if somebody else would like to jump in, I would really appreciate that. Talk a little bit more about the doctrine of discovery. 
I can say a few things because I I was surprised to find out that it's only been like common like public knowledge in what since the 90s like 30 years I was born in 88 so my lifetime I grew up knowing about this because I come from a family of like activism and like traditional we know our culture and our language and our beliefs and I'm very fortunate that I grew up with this knowledge but it was surprising to find out that not everybody knows what the doctrine of discovery is and like patriarchy and assimilation and genocide and how that was all passed down and continues to be passed down. So what stuck out to me the most when I was about 16 and I learned about this was how they looked at us like a subhuman species, how they call us a band of Indian Indians is equivalent to like a herd of deer. We were not equal to them as human beings. We were in between them and animals. So that was what, how they were able to justify committing genocide on us just like they killed off all the buffalo they you know it was like equal in their eyes they just were killing off a herd of animals and were removing us to take our land and then the way they treat the land is just the same like all the industrial contamination here in Akwesasne is just it's a prime example of how they treat our people how they treat our land and then like how the silence you say how they were went into bankruptcy and nobody held them accountable and how the tribe had to take it upon themselves to clean it up and make better standards because theirs was 10 parts per million and ours was one. So they deem that is a safe, that's safe for us because we're not human in their eyes. They could care less how that affects our people. We're down the river from that, that, you know, that it's so ingrained in the belief system, even throughout our own people, like to be submissive and to just take it. For what it is and not question it because the education system has like you know instilled in us since residential school that we just obey we listen to what's said and we accept it for the truth and we don't question it so that now whenever these things are coming up and the young people are like saying why is it like this why can't we drink our water and fish in our rivers and eat our fish more than once a month and now we're like upset because how did we let it get to this and it's because the older people were disconnected from our land and put in residential schools because they tried to assimilate us and they couldn't until they ripped us from our parents' arms. And what those children bought back from that residential school and that patriarchal way of thinking that came from the doctrine of discovery, they brought back home to us and they carried it with them. So now we're just beginning to heal, like our Dodos and my parents' generation, they carry it with them, whether they realize it or not. Like I have a friend who moved into our grandmother's yard and they have a big glass pit and like they buried it in their yards because they didn't know better to put like glass and garbage and just dump it in their backyards and bury it there and then we dig it up and find this big pit of glass like why would they do that but they didn't know better because they're disconnected from the land which resulted from residential school which resulted from the doctrine of discovery that's the first thing that comes to mind thank you so just in uh in closing here, um, do any of you, Craig, uh, Jackie, or Stephanie, do you have any uh, thoughts for the future that you'd like to share with our audience? I, I can start. Um, thoughts for the future. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess for the people listening in is that in your community, whether, you know, wherever you are, if you're on tribal lands or not, if you're seeing if you're disliking how things are, you know, you um, just don't sit back. You know, there's probably organizations in your community that are doing something. Um, just find out, you know, just ask around. You probably find something that to your liking. Uh, there's a lot of, for example, there's agriculture, you know, um, groups in a lot of communities and there's nonprofits and you can um, just get involved and they're, they're all doing uh, good things. And if there isn't something going on, you know, that's uh, to your liking, that, that's near and dear to your heart, then, then start something yourself. You know, you be that one to get things going. Even if it's just you um, being active in it, then, then you're still doing something and yeah, that's it. That's it. Is is take action yourself. Uh, work for your for your community for your people. 
Go. Thank you. How about uh, Stephanie and Jackie? You got any um, thoughts for the future? Um, I would definitely uplift what Greg just said. Um, this is not a time to theorize anymore. This is the time to act. Um, it's been the time to act for a really long time. Um, we have to build relationships with each other and uh, understand these root causes. I saw somebody in the chat ask about what the word justice means to me or what the word justice means for us in general. And I would say that justice um, is what I would, I would, I would really want to um, promote this concept of actionable justice and actionable liberation. Um, we're not looking at, um, you know, this isn't just about lawsuits. It isn't just about, um, you know, one person's health. It's not actually an individualistic journey for any of us anymore, right? That's a Western concept, that individualism. This is about collectively building a new future together, a future for our faces to come. Um, we are the ones who are responsible for that. We are responsible to the land, to the water, to each other. Um, and we're in a long line of ancestors ourselves that, um, you know, we're preparing these spaces for the faces to come. So we can't wait any longer. Um, there's individual action, but the collective action is really where I would suggest, um, you know, getting in touch and, and putting your power behind whatever that power is for you behind these movements, this is the time. The time is now, there is no more time. Um, what happens in the next year is literally going to make or break the, the lives of our future generations. So um, we're here for it. <laughs> we're here for it for all of you. Yala. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, any thoughts for the future? Uh, yeah, I agree with what they both said and what came to mind was a story and it's it it's most definitely relevant to what people are going to do in the future because we're at the land back camp and it's just myself and my family most of the time and we made the move as a clan the clan i come from and i talked to allies that came to visit and they told me this story that really stuck out because i was really starting to wonder like where is everybody like why is it just us here like people are coming to visit but nobody's made the move on the land like we did so they told me a story about the Wet'suwet'en, like Frida and where they're out in Unistoten and how it all started off with Frida and her man. And it was just them two there. That's all it took and look at what that turned into. It doesn't take, you don't have to wait for a big group of people. If you, like, like Greg said, do something yourself if you can't find it because one person is powerful. Like my husband was crazy enough to marry me and He's been like going along the ride with me, but you know, that's all it takes is that one person to say, I'm going to do it. And then once you do it and people see that it can be done, they'll be right there to support you and they'll be right there behind you, if not beside you. So don't, like she said, time is of the essence. You can't wait any longer. Whatever you feel in your heart that you need to do, you need to do it and just know that there's the support. Good, good, very good invitation. Yeah, uh, one yeah. of the things in our, in our, uh, our ways, our longhouse ways is, uh, you know, not believing in the force or, or um, telling people what they should or should not do. But it is, this is an invitation to all of you that are listening tonight to take some action uh, in your own community. Think locally, work locally and think globally because this affects everyone. And I just want to, uh, sum up tonight by thanking you all for great presentations very informative i had a hard time keeping up <laughs> took copious notes here and uh this uh production will be uh put up on the website website I, i'll leave that up to our host uh to let you know where you can uh view uh this this webinar in the future. So I'd like to turn it back now to um, Blake and Zitson and uh, just thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, for listening and for uh, taking good care of our mother, the earth. Not to reiterate too much, all the amazing and powerful words that you all said, but Niowa, thank you so much 
to you, Agnes, for moderating this conversation, for helping weave together these very extremely, extremely vital topics for all of us, for all of our communities and for the world. And thank you to you all, panelists, for sharing your experience, your knowledge, everything that you decided to take the time and share with us tonight. And we would also like to thank you, audience, for all your questions and contributions. Um, also wanted to, if you haven't seen it in the chat, wanted to let you all know that you are getting lots of thanks there. Um, from Himani, thank you everyone so much for this insightful discussion. Um, from Holly Thompson, Niawa, to all tonight, peace. From Michael Twist, thank you for sharing your words, experience, and time with us. And one last thing I wanted, we wanted to mention was before, in the very beginning of the discussion, there was a question specifically to you, um, Kayetidake, which is, um, it would be great to get that editorial of yours in local white, in quotation marks, newspapers, because everyone needs to learn. This is something that all of our communities need to work together and share. So um, we hope to see you next time. We will be having our next panel discussion next week, 6.30 p.m. Wednesday, the 30th of September. It's going to be the environmental future of the St. Lawrence watershed. Right now, we talk about all the issues are facing us now, and you all ended this discussion talking about our future. So yes, that conversation is going to continue in our next iteration. If you want to see this recording, it will be available on nocoenvironment.org. It's going to be available on our YouTube page. So anyone can watch this again, share it with friends and family, because it, this message needs to spread. And if you want to contact our panelists, we will be putting up a flyer with our email. So if you want to reach anybody, you can also reach out to us, and we will share any comments, contributions, anything with the panelists here tonight. And so we hope you enjoyed tonight, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Skoge, I. You know what? Hola. 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 H